Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, we have a great audience here today. My name is Vijay Trasal. I am a surgical oncologist. I'm a cancer surgeon at City of Hope. Uh, we have a number of viewers online. I would like to welcome them also. Good morning to some and uh, good evening to some. I have some friends in Kashmir, where I come from, who had uh, wanted to join this live. So good evening to all of them. It is 10.30 uh, their time in the evening. Um, <laughs> We are all from City of Hope. Uh, City of Hope, as some of you might know, is a comprehensive cancer center. It is one of the few NCI-designated cancer centers. That means that the designation is given to organizations that have all the elements on their platform, elements of research, elements of education, elements of cancer care, elements what is called translational research. And one of the key elements is to be able to reach out into the community, both for taking cancer out into the community, taking cancer care out into the community, taking Duarte out in the community, and also for education. And part of the process, what we're doing here today, is continuing that education, answering some of the questions, some of the myths that are out there which really complicate things, and clarity on that front, both from the physician side and from the community side is very critical. So I would like to introduce my panel today. To my left is Dr. Myring. Uh, she is a hematologist oncologist with City of Hope. To her left is Dr. Michael Lin, who is a GYN oncologist dealing with cancers of the female reproductive organs uh, and thereof. And uh, on to the lateral left side is Susie Melkonian. She is a hematologist oncologist also with City of Hope and her primary location is in the Mission Hills area. So now that we introduce everybody else, I would like to get to the meat of the program. Uh, what we are here today is to talk about some of the myths that we have uh, in, in, in the air uh, that, that confuse things. We have done these, what is called Ask the Experts, where you get uh, the top people in the field asking some of the questions. Today's focus is on lifestyles as to what we can do to understand what can push our body towards cancer or prevent that. And I will just throw out questions and let them fight it out and <laughs> let us see whether they can uh, come to a consensus. Uh, one of the first questions I have is, what I hear is a lot of the uh, data that talks about diet, diet and cancer. And, and we know that diet and cancer have a, a very um, congruent relationship. So, Somebody told me you have to eat like three tons of blueberries to prevent cancer. <laughs> what is true? That's probably true. I, I would think that it would, it would take great amount. Um, I am pretty sure that no amount of blueberries is going to guarantee that you're not going to get cancer. But we know that that is one of the superfoods that you folks have all heard about, and there's a few others, but berries are a known superfood. And that means that they're sort of um, free radical sponges. They suck up all the bad free radicals, and we know that free radicals can cause cancer. Um, there's other factors, though. So you could eat all the blueberries in the world, and you still might get your cancer. So. Um, it and there's a lot of others other than blueberries, mm -hmm. the, the cruciferous uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, what are cruciferous vegetables? Uh, broccoli, um, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Smelly uh, ones. Uh, <laughs> what? The smelly ones. The smelly ones. The smelly ones. <laughs> and then there's some others that are not, that are not cruciferous that also have... Um, what is it called, sulfonamide, something like that, which help the body uh, clear. Um, for example, we know that if you eat charred foods, that there are amines, um, heterocyclic amines, that can cause DNA damage. If you eat these foods along with them, you have some broccoli, you have an arugula salad, or something like that, that actually helps the body clear some of these um, heterocyclic amines. So in that way, they work as sort of superfoods. So it's not just blueberries. There's a lot of things out there. So Suzy, you brought out two things that I wanted to elaborate on. One is, what are free radicals? And what do they do? And do we need them? Are they good or bad? <laughs> so it's her fault. Cause DNA damage. Okay. Well, no, but I mean, just in general terms, a free radical is, if you can think of, um, 
a, an atom or a, I guess, you know, with a bunch of circulating electrons. I mean, you guys have all seen the pictures of those in books. And if you can imagine that one of them is sort of not balanced and it's looking for a home, it's looking for a partner, it's looking for something to join up with because it doesn't like to be by itself. And it will get it from your body. Well, if you have certain, um, and it's called a free radical, if you have certain things in your body that can actually join up with that and secure it so it stops scavenging, that's what we consider to be something that is a, a free radical sponge, essentially. And it will protect your body because if you do not do that, it will bind onto your DNA, bind onto whatever parts of your anatomy that it wants to and cause damage. So that's basically what a free radical is. And free radicals come from a lot of different places. And there is no way to avoid having free radicals in your body. But there are things that can certainly increase your, your rate of production of free radicals. Very fatty foods, very, very starchy foods, um, sun exposure, medications, no medications, high blood sugar. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. So, you know, it's pretty hard to prevent it. So the best example I've heard of a free radical is it is a teenage boy or a girl who has just had a breakup. And <laughs> That's a great and example. And is ready to, to, to combine and mate with anybody. <laughs> And that's what they do in the body. They will combine with the mind. DNA and it, it is not the right fit. That is not who you want to combine with at that time. And that creates a downstream problem that can, that can be <laughs> difficult. Um, how about charred foods? You brought a charred food, Susie. What does that do? Well, th this is something that my patients ask me a lot. And living in California, um, I have a lot of barbecues and the meat always gets charred. My husband likes to char everything, sorry. Um, so they, yes, the, um, what happens is that you get these um, proteins and meat that are um, altered by high heat. If you cook them over, we usually sear the meat so that it, it doesn't, it tastes better, it tastes juicier, mm -hmm. but that's actually, um, but you, at a high heat, and that's going to cause these heterocyclic amines, which are carcinogenic. They cause DNA damage. Um, so it doesn't mean that there's, there's things you can do to kind of balance that. It doesn't mean that you can't have barbecues. Um, you, I think marinating uh, has been shown to decrease about 60% of these uh, heterocyclic amines. You can cook it at a lower heat and longer. Um, you can eat these superfoods um, along with it, have a, an arugula salad uh, with your hamburger. Um, so I've heard that gastric cancer specifically is one of the cancers that can happen with high charred, high salt typical food. Is that That correct? and pancreatic. I think there was a study from Minnesota that said about 60% increased risk of pancreatic cancer with these uh, charred foods. But yes, stomach and pancreatic are the ones that are salient in my mind. So if we were to now combine all the information that we have regarding diet, obviously this is a, a month-long debate and dialogue and then the different <laughs> foods that can... What would we give to our audience? What, what information and education and pointers would, would you give this audience about diet? Well, I think I just... About diet in general? About say, let's well, say, charred foods. Well, the, well, we said marinate it. Marinate it seems to, because what happens is when you're cooking the food and that fat actually, you know, goes into the fire and is then vaporized back onto the meat. So if you're marinating it, it's less likely to do that. Eat more fish, cook it at a lower temperature, longer, and, and eat these superfoods along with it. And remember that barbecued food is probably healthy in that you are getting rid of some of that fat. You know, you're not cooking it in its fat. So, you know, everything in, in, in moderation and uh, don't go stop eating because I said, oh, the one study said 60% pancreatic. I certainly am not going to stop eating you know, barbecues. So how about the supplemental foods? Now we get to these, a lot of these herbals that are um, in the market that we say um, supplemental foods are complementary alternative medicine. What would, you, um, what would you advise the audience? I don't, 
advise any of my patients to do anything um, complementary except vitamin D. Okay. Uh, I don't know what the other, and then, I mean, we can come back to that, but I don't know if anybody feels strongly about anything other than that. You know, that's a great question, and I get asked that all the time. And, you know, probably lots of supplements probably just go right out into your urine. Um, our body is very elegant and that it knows what it needs and it extracts what it needs from your food. So if you're eating a balanced diet and you're getting all of the different food groups and you're eating enough fruits and vegetables and you're eating lean protein sources, you probably don't need all of the um, uh, nutritional supplements that are out there. I also recommend vitamin D for my patients mostly because I think in this country we seem to have um, an epidemic of low vitamin D levels, but I think there's still quite a lot of data we don't have about that. I mean, you know, we don't really know. But, um, you know, a lot of my patients take things like turmeric and cucurumin and all kinds of stuff. And, I, and really, the data, we don't know. We don't know if those things make a difference. So I don't actively recommend them because we also don't know if there are negative effects and there just isn't any science. So trying to close this question, a lot of my patients who are on chemotherapy or who are getting radiation, what do you think a lot of these supplemental medications, whether they are free radicals or whether they are um, free radical scavengers or whether they are supplemental foods, what would you advise people? I usually advise to not do it while you're on treatment, especially because the effects can counterbalance or potentiate your treatment, and neither one of those is good. So, for example, if you are consuming high amounts of free radical scavenger medications or foods, you could interfere with the effects or the effectiveness of radiation therapy because it works by creating free radicals in a localized place. You know, they're not everywhere, but that's what it does. But that's part of the treatment. Um, and likewise, with chemotherapy agents, some of these things may actually interfere with the metabolism of the drug, and it could increase toxicity levels. And we simply do not know. And not only do we not know, every person is a little bit different. All of us have slightly different enzymes in our livers and all the rest of it. What, you, what your experience might be might, different, might be different than what someone else's experience might be. So we have to be very careful about that because we simply do not have safety information. Information. Yeah, they're not regulated. No, so not at all. So don't know if it's the active or if it's the inactive compound. Exactly. The, the dosages, and, and I agree, a lot of our chemotherapy comes from natural, you know, plants, taxanes from the yew tree. And so just because it comes from a tree doesn't mean, necessarily mean that it's safe and uh, it may as you said, potentiate. It may increase Who risk knows? for bleeding, decrease the immune system, uh, cause liver toxicity. That's a big concern. And I usually advise my patients before not to take any mega doses of any of these supplements or vitamins. Um, and if they are going to do it, then let's talk about it, bring it in, let's look it up. I've got a book on my desk because this is not something that, you know, is part of conventional um, medicine. Um, so I, I just, I, I do not encourage them to, to take any of these. How about you, So we Michael? have a complete department of complementary and alternative medicine at City of Hope that is working on specifically these questions is that not only may some of these drugs help with chemotherapy, potentiate the toxicity of chemotherapy, they may decrease the effect of chemotherapy, but we do need to work on them because some of them may be beneficial, except like Dr. Myring said, they're not regulated, and the ones that are regulated that have been worked on are the ones we are actually um, in clinical trials right now. We have clinical trials on grape seed extracts for breast cancer. We have clinical trials on mushrooms uh, extracts on, and we have some very novel herbal medications that we are using that we know help with decreased cell cycle multiplication, helps prevent the cells from multiplying and that can help together. So let's go to a different question. I asked Dr. Uh, Michael Lynn. We heard a lot about increased risk of breast cancers with estrogens, increased risk of breast cancers with deodorants, increased risk of breast cancer with underwear bras. Could you educate us as what the truth is? <laughs> um, I mean, I think the, the real estrogen in breast cancer, I mean, I think most medical oncologists will say it definitely contributes to that. Um, and therefore, 
estrogen replacement therapy for breast cancer patients is, is a pretty much a big no-no. Um, other than breast cancer, um, especially young women, uh, it, it is difficult sometimes not to give in hormonal replacement therapy, you know, because they're so young. Um, but I think, I think for, for, the, for the breast cancer, I tell my patient to pretty much stay away from, from estrogen. How about postmenopausal women who um, have decreased estrogen in the body? Do you recommend supplemental estrogen? And if you do, what, what caveats are there? Um, I think if you look at G1 cancer, yes. um, um, the role of, of estrogen replacement therapy in uterine cancer is quite controversial because the majority is, is estrogen dominant, stimulated. Um, but there are you know, people that are low grade, you know, low stage, and they're symptomatic. You, know, you do it case by case, risk and benefit. Uh, there's no randomized trial on the safety of, of, uh, of uh, estrogen replacement therapy. But I tell patient case by case, uh, if they're really symptomatic, low grade, low stage, we'll consider it. And is there a time frame that you recommend that for? Um, I, I would say you know, never. Uh, sometime maybe maybe after the first two years, you know, where the risk of recurrence is sort of decreased significantly, and then we can start after two years. You know. So there was a large study, Susie, that talked about the supplemental estrogen. There was the uh, the British study. Can you educate us about that? Um, that that looked at uh, following patients over 20 years that had a higher risk of breast cancer. Is that something that we should worry about, um, increased breast cancer with hormone replacements or ovarian cancers? Not Any ovarian cancer, I think. More breast cancer. More breast cancer, breast cancer right. right. Um, I mean, we treat uh, hormone positive breast cancer with hormone inhibition. Right. Uh, so that's pretty established. Um, I'm talking about supplemental hormones. Supplemental. Like, um, so I think the most data that I, I mean, the strongest data I, that I know of and that what brought it all to light was the Nurses Health Study, which you know followed thousands of women over years and years and years and years. And you know, we had been under the belief that estrogen replacement therapy actually helped stave off heart disease and osteoporosis, mm -hmm. and it looked like such a panacea and then as it turns out, after we got the results, all this, these thousands of women, that the women who were taking supplemental estrogen for menopausal symptoms or for prediction of heart disease, go figure, had an increased risk of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. So we know that it's true. And when we look at you know, independent causes of breast cancer, breast cancer, it's not just estrogen. And I don't want to mislead you into thinking that's true. But we know that lifetime exposure to estrogen does seem to influence the development of breast cancer. And I also do not recommend systemic replacement of estrogen in patients who have a history of breast cancer later. And I don't think that supplemental estrogens in women for postmenopausal symptoms, I think it should be avoided at all costs. At all costs. Although, that being said, probably women can take it for a short period of time if they haven't had a history of breast cancer for a short period of time, one to two years, no longer. I mean, if you're taking it for 10 years, you've taken it too long and it's time to really try to get off. So what would you recommend then? You know, I uh, probably will never know the feeling, <laughs> uh, hopefully not. Well, there uh, is Lupron, uh, you the, know. We can cost, we can, we can, we can simulate <laughs> okay. this for you. Well, I, I, I'm not gonna go there, <laughs> but how about, what should, what should women do? Postmenopausal symptoms, as I hear, and um, I, I no women who go through significant symptoms, what should they do to, to neutralize that or, or decrease those symptoms? First of all, I like to say that those symptoms are nothing to, to laugh at. And I think only f female physicians who have gone through that would know it interferes with sleep, which then interferes with ability to function, and uh, then that causes depression. I mean, this is a real problem. Um, there were studies that showed that serotonin and norepinephrine inhibitors um, will alleviate these symptoms. So uh, more medication. Well, as I said, it is a real problem. 
So if you don't think it's a real problem, you're not going to need medication. But if it's, so when patients come to me, I say, well, how, how bothersome is this? Are you waking up four times a day? Are you unable to function the next day? And they'll say, no, okay, fine, we won't. But if it gets, if it gets to that point uh, that it's severe, then yes, medication. Yeah, I usually do aggressively recommend a lot of lifestyle modifications to try to get through it because, you know, all of the medications, they do help a lot of women, but they have side effects that are also sometimes unacceptable. And so we're sort of weighing those things, you know, risks and benefits, you know, and I, I mean, things like using cotton bed clothes, your, your, I mean, your sheets and all your blankets should be cotton. If you're having hot flashes at night that are waking you up, you should not have any acrylic on your bed. You know, these are very common sense things, but we don't think about them. And so I usually, you know, keep a fan with you, wear layers. I mean, all that stuff is important, but those are just the hot flash symptoms. I mean, there's other symptoms, mood swings. Those are huge. Mood swings happen with menopause. I mean, sexual dysfunction happens with menopause. Those are all issues that have to be addressed individually. It's not, it's a, it's a bucket, yes, but it's a bucket with a bunch of little partitions. And we have to find out which thing in that bucket is bothering people the most and try to take care of those things and see if we can't get through the bulk of it. But if not, medications are exactly what we need to do in many cases. Usually, usually if um, family history is important, I and mean, if there's a strong family history of breast cancer, I say it's best to stay away from it. Uh, and I counsel them the best time to take them is the first 10 years after menopause, between 50 and 60. After 60, you should try to get off of it because you know, uh, potential complications start, risk of cancer starts. So I counsel them the first 10 years is the best. You get your maximum benefit from it. But take into account of family history. You know, so. The final thing I wanted to say is, uh, yes, more medication. It's sometimes necessary because we are, we are treating. We're not ta you're talking about just replacement. We actually exacerbate some of the symptoms of menopause by blocking hormones uh, with aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen and et cetera. And I would prefer to add on a medication to make sure that that patient is taking the appropriate medication then have them stop and, and not take it and increase the risk of recurrence. So let's go to a completely different topic. I've heard that cell phones cause cancer. What do you think? I don't think that there's any conclusive studies that show that cell phones cause cancer. Don't you think on the brain tumors right there that the phone got, no? I, um, there is no data no. that we have that actually shows no, the conclusive. cell phones. No, yeah. I know. So there was uh, a study that uh, looked at where do these cancers in uh, people who we think brain cancers happen in uh, the phones. And it did look at temporal lobes, which is where you hold the phone, and it looked at parotids, which uh, had a slightly higher risk of incidence. But what was interesting is that those studies where population-based studies, which is when you take the whole population over a long period of time and look at what happened, these studies were done even before cell phones were at their highest peak. So sometimes we have these observational studies, like we have patients who were near a power line that developed leukemias, which was another myth that we had, um, we, we had worried about. But majority of those is called recall bias, that means Somebody who had a leukemia, we asked them, did you ever live next to a power line? They say, oh yes, this was the time there was a power line close by, but when you compare them to people who did not have leukemias, they did not have the recall bias. Even though they may have lived close to a power line, they never remembered that they lived close to a power line because they never had leukemias. Let's talk about another myth that I think is important to address. The, the myth of when you cut on a tumor, you expose it to air, and you actually cause it to grow faster. What is the truth about that, Dr. Lin? Um, you know, personally, I don't observe that doing surgeries. Um, I think that's just a myth that you come in here from the South. Um, and I sort of tell patients that that's tr not true. And sometimes patients would be reluctant to go through surgery based on that. Right. You know, I don't want you to open me up and just spread over the place. So but, but, but I must say, you know, the certain tumor, I do agree that once you disrupt the tumor, it tends to be more aggressive in certain sarcoma. I, I, I do, but I don't think that's exposure to air, but that just, you sort of, you know, disrupt the capsule 
you sort of, you know, and allow to disseminate, you know. So what, what would you do to prevent that? I mean, so that is a reality. So what I have heard and which is borne by data is that when you cut on a tumor, you stimulate growth factors in there and I think we need to give credence to some of those things that growth factors will stimulate the cell to grow. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't have an option, you need to do a biopsy. What would you recommend most people to say, yes, we are going to do this resection by going outside of the tumor? Are there any well, other factors? Well, operation, we try to take every precaution. If it's localized, try not to rupture it and try to remove intact. So um, the important thing is to go beyond the tumor, right. not go into the tumor, so you're not disrupting any of the cells that are in there or even spilling them out because that would be a real worry, especially in your field which is already ovarian cancer that already spread. Right, especially early stage. Do you get that question a lot? Um, I don't get it as often because I'm a medical oncologist, but it comes up once in a while when there's a biopsy requested or needed, and patients are very frightened that by doing the biopsy, it's going to stimulate the growth of the cancer. And, and it's hard for me to tell them that that may not be true, but I have to also reassure them that we have to know what we're dealing with, and then we need, if it is indeed cancer, we need to proceed as quickly as possible to remove the whole area, and that we aren't going to do that unless we have cancer. So, you know, at this point, I mean, hopefully, at some point in the future, we're going to have other ways to diagnose cancer, circulating cells, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that are being so looked at. So doing a blood test. And right. I mean, we're not there yet. We're not there. I have to be really clear that I mean, someone say, oh, can't you do that tumor marker and tell? No, not yet. But we are certainly working on it, you know, and there are certainly, I mean, there are some kinds of cancers where that's true, but not solid tumors, mm -hmm. you know. And so right now, that's the technology that we have. And we ha that's, that's what we have to do. And I reassure them that hopefully for your grandchildren, we'll have something better, you know, and... Um, hopefully they'll never die of cancer. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully so I think one thing that we have to uh, address and explain is that there is a type of biopsy called an incisional biopsy where you cut into the tumor, take a little piece, but there is also what is a corneal biopsy where you don't need to cut into the skin, you need to make a small cut, take a little core, it's like not letting the tumor wake up letting the cells stay there, just taking a little piece through a core, that way you're not disrupting any cells. I think the type of biopsy is important. Let's go to another topic um, of uh, smoking. I have patients coming to tell me, I smoked 20 years back and now I stopped. Do I still have risk of cancer? I had secondhand smoking, do I still have risk of cancer? Any light we can shed on that? Yes, you can still get yes, cancer. Yes, you can still get cancer. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Unfortunately, smoking, um, you know, and they have these great graphs that show that the minute you quit smoking, your risks of certain diseases decreases and you start to approach the level of people who never smoked. This is really true for heart disease and heart disease and heart disease and heart disease. Late onset, though, people can still get malignancies because the damage to the DNA already happened. So, you know, it, it requires sort of two hits to the DNA. That's the first hit, it already happened. You're just waiting to get old and get your second hit, basically. So lung cancer can still happen, head and neck cancer can still happen, emphysema can still happen, which isn't cancer. So all those things can even happen, even if you quit 20 years ago. Your risks do decrease though, they do decrease. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't quit. You, you have to quit still. It's... So you talked about the two hit, what would be the other hit that so, so really, to, to cause a cell to run amok and become cancerous, the DNA takes damage. And so, you know, DNA comes in two strings. They're next to each other. They complement each other. So and one from your mom, one from your Basically, your yeah. One from your one mom, one from your dad. So let's say that you've been smoking, and remember all those free radical things we talked about? Let's say you had damage to one half, one string. Okay, you know, your body's still gonna do okay. That cell's probably not gonna turn into cancer yet as long as you don't get another one that's from the other side that's busted up too. Now you have a break in two places and the cell's gonna run amok, the DNA is no longer normal, it's gonna become a cancer cell. So that can happen and once you have that break, and we all get breaks in our DNA just from living on this planet and having metabolism, that's normal. The question is, is are you gonna increase the number of breaks, therefore increasing the number of risks that you can develop cancer? So. so can you inherit some of those breaks? Absolutely. Absolutely, you can inherit some of these breaks. And that's like 
women who are carrying BRCA mutations. I know a lot of my patients have asked me a lot of questions about this. There's also some very rare conditions which just cause multiple malignancies in people, and they start getting them at very young ages. And that's because the, pre, the break they had, they were born with it. They didn't get it later. They, they were born with it. And then that means that all those little breaks that happen through life normally, your risks are higher because you already have a break that's basically in all of your cells. So, so is it... So what should, we, what should we blame? We want to blame <laughs> something. Should we blame the genes or should we blame the environment? I blame luck. I luck? Blame, yeah, luck. Because you know what? You, you do everything you can do. You don't know. Your parents were fine. Maybe they even had a gene, but it never was expressed. Maybe you had bad luck and you happened to get a bad break right where that genetic mutation was. I think a lot of it's luck or bad luck. Um, you know, I mean, you do what you can do to change your environment. But I think it's a combination of the two things, plus probably things we don't know. It, it can't be just one thing, or we would be able to fix it. And it's way too complex for So that. I wonder whether there's a study looking at who wins in Vegas and whether they get more cancer or not. <laughs> that would be a great study to do. Um, I think that there are environmental and lifestyle changes that we can make. Of course. Um, tobacco is at the very top of the list of uh, preventable uh, behaviors. Um, obesity is becoming, is almost supplanting tobacco. Um, ASCO is now uh, recommending that oncologists talk to their patients about obesity. Um, it's associated with many, many uh, malignancies. Uh, there's estimated about 3.5% of cancer deaths annually are due to obesity. Um, there are a number of other things, nutrition we touched on, um, vitamins, um, there are um, exercise, vaccines, um, stress. So there are a number of behavioral changes that we can make in environmental, um, influences that can we can manipulate to our advantage. Tell me about stress. Stress is is something we uh, we talk about a lot. How how would stress cause cancer? Well, well, the association between stress and the the effect it has on the immune system is very well recognized in oncology. Um, so when you're under a chronic stress, not just the stress of, you know, a car, somebody cutting in front of you as you're driving, but let's say marital strife, bereavement, um, taking care of a loved one for a very long time, or just feeling like you're in a situation that you can't escape. So this kind of a chronic stress uh, does affect the immune system. And the immune system is your first line of defense against all malignancies. I think Dr. Meyering touched upon that we're always getting these DNA breaks and that our immune system is going and clearing that. Uh, when you're under this kind of a chronic stress, you get an increased level of glucocorticoid steroids, which um, suppress the immune system. And um, this is uh, an area uh, of actually uh, looking at therapeutics using the immune system, um, T cell vaccines, et cetera. So um, stress is something that can, re stress, lack of sleep, all of these things that impact your immune system negatively, that suppress your immune system. And so what do we do about it? I guess yoga, see a therapist, <laughs> Take vacation. So what about the person? Take a vacation, so yes. What about the young, healthy person that comes to you and they're 30 years old, they've never smoked a day in their life, they don't drink, they do yoga every day, they've taken great care of themselves, they eat perfectly. Bad luck. Right. <laughs> no, you do what you can. It is not going to prevent you from getting cancer. It is what you're going, in general, but it is going to, you do what you can for your health. So you, you decrease your are, risks. We are, we are putting bad luck as lack of our knowledge. I mean, we just don't know. It's not bad luck. So 
30 years back, <laughs> yes. we thought a young 25-year-old woman getting breast cancer was because of bad luck. But now we know it may be 5% of them might have a P53 mutation or a BRCA mutation or a PALB3 mutation or a Which MEC mutation. Which is still bad luck because they got it from their parents. Okay, well, if it were <laughs> a bad luck But you like label that, it <laughs> and, you, and you screen for it and you prevent it by prophylactic oophorectomies and mastectomies and etc. So it's not just... It is bad luck, but you can, you can turn it... You can manipulate it. Right. You can affect it. So a lot of cancers, and this is something that I wanted to ask the whole panel, the public's opinion of what as physicians or as healthcare organizations, the information that we give is taken with a sense of trepidation. When we initially talked about tobacco, for a long time, tobacco companies involving physicians and involving National Institute of Health said tobacco is not a cause of cancer. Tobacco is not the major cause. And even after decades and decades and decades, as an industry, we have not been able to weed that out. So how would you explain to a group of people who have this fear that doctors and organizations are in cahoots talking about, let us say, talking about sugars? Sugars, do sugars cause cancer? And what does the industry do to prevent, to stimulate, and what, does nat what do national organizations do to con control it? So does sugar cause cancer? Does sugar stimulate the cells to cause cancer? I, I can't even take that, that seriously, I mean, that, that question. I don't think that, you know, the, the sugar is necessary. It's, your, your brain, you know, needs glucose. So uh, to me, that does not make any sense. Any other differing opinions or do we agree to that? I have the same opinion, but I will say that I think a lot of it comes from folks who've had PET scans, and they're, you know, they tell them, don't eat any sugar for the day ahead of time oh. because we need your tumor to be hungry so that it picks up all the glucose. And I think that you know, it's important to realize that, yes, cancer cells are very metabolically active. They are hungry, but so is your body. And if you do not take in glucose, and you do have cancer or sugar, if you don't take in sugar and your cancer is there, your cancer is going to take that nutrition from your body. So it's not going to stop your cancer, but it will malnourish you. So you need to take care of yourself. So I think that what we're talking about is taking plain sugar like glucose by itself, which mm -hmm. is completely different than taking sugars that are bound to other things that are released slowly. I mean, we know that plain sugar sodas, for example, will lead to obesity. You talked about right. obesity-related cancers and that your glycemic index is different. Mm -hmm. Diabetes is a precursor for cancer. A lot of patients who have diabetes have a higher incidence of developing cancers. Endometrial cancers, for example, with mm -hmm. obesity, mm -hmm. breast cancers with exactly. obesity is a higher incidence. So would you think that there is an indirect relationship? Well, if you overeat fat, I think we're talking obesity and not sugar, um, so and, and, and ob indirectly, but your body, if you take protein, it's going to break it down to sugar and, you know, you, you, because your muscles need it and your brain needs it. So, uh, yes, you should cut, you, I think if you look at it from an obesity perspective, yes, it's related, but in and of itself, I don't think that it's directly related. And uh, the mechanisms that we of, uh, have um, action in terms of causing cancer with obesity are, are many. We talked about breast and endometrial, where you have uh, higher um, levels of hormones because they are synthesized in the fat tissue. Um, also, um, Inflammatory, obese people have to ha tend to have a chronic inflammatory sort of a state. So, uh, and we know that chronic inflammations can lead to malignancies. Um, there are also insulin like growth factors that can cause um, dysregulation of um, cell, um, normal cell um, proliferation. 
It interferes with apoptosis. It's a word you might have heard, which is, an, which is a, a programmed cell death. You know, leaves turn yellow and then they fall. That's programmed that they're going to turn yellow and fall. And cells also have this programmed death and um, obesity um, because you have these other um, growth hormones, insulin-like growth hormones, etc., that that interferes with um, programmed cell death. Um, and there's other um, um, so uh, like mTOR diet. inhibitors and, and all of that 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 uh, that affect um, one who is obese. So it, it really is sort of well understood and it's an important connection. And as I said, ASCO's actually put out, ASCO is American Society of Clinical Oncologists, has put out handbooks for patients um, to prevent obesity. And we tend to think that patients who are cancer patients, don't, we don't need to talk to them about obesity because they're on chemotherapy and they're gonna lose weight. But actually, you've probably noticed, I've noticed that people gain weight. They get tired, they don't exercise as much. They, some of the treatments that we give, steroids, et cetera, some of the hormones actually you know, make them even uh, more obese. So it really is, I think, you know, when they say the things that your doctors don't talk to you about is we probably don't talk to you enough about obesity. So coming on back to the diet question, I was at the cricket field last week and somebody told me that there was a study that said if I drank a bottle of alcohol every evening, I would, it would be better for me. What is the truth? <laughs> uh, alcohol is considered by the American Food and Drugs, um, I, I, I forget the acronym, a carcinogen. Okay. It really is associated with a lot of malignancies, uh, breast cancer specifically, uh, risk for developing a breast cancer. Um, uh, that's what we were talking about earlier, that million woman study in the United Kingdom showed that actually if you take something like 10 grams of alcohol a day, it will increase your risk of breast cancer by 7%. So, you know, if you're taking in 40 grams of alcohol, that's like 28% increase. So, it's associated with breast cancer, with esophageal cancer, uh, liver cancer, um, head and neck cancer, squamous head and neck cancer. Uh, what else? Maybe pancreatic so cancer. How the beneficial effect on other organs? A glass of wine in the evening. There, are there any studies that look at moderate alcohol and impact on the human body? Yes. <laughs> so, of course, it's a... It's I'm looking always, at you. It's, well, I know you are. So it's always a discussion because everybody has a different group of risk factors. You know, if they have a very strong history, family history of cancer, breast cancer, you know, I'm usually, especially if they have a history of smoking, I'm, I'm, I think I never recommend drinking to people, but a lot of people have very strong family histories of heart disease and, you know, so then they're, they're being recommended, yes, have a half a glass of wine or a, wine, a glass of wine a day. And so we really have to be very judicious here and I think not be militant because certainly for some people, maybe their risk of heart disease is significantly higher than their risk of cancer or vice versa. So unfortunately it is sort of, we are at opposing, you know, sort of opposing opinions here. And I think that we still have quite a lot to know about that. Usually for my breast cancer patients though, I do recommend they abstain from alcohol right. if at all possible. Um, just because even very small, small amounts right. seems to increase the risk. Right. But else than breast cancer, you would not recommend people staying off of alcohol. Well, I would. Well, I discourage it's it. A, uh, you know, I do discourage it if they're cancer patients. It's just, I mean, I think the predominance of my patients are breast uh, cancer patients. So I've I've gone off on my patients and just sort of lectured them at length. The ones that have, let's say, you know, uh, that are that drink and have hepatitis. To see, um, I there's a very high risk of cirrhosis in that combination. It's synergistic. It's like one plus one equals three. Uh, so I would very, um, you know, much uh, discourage them from from drinking. Uh, so there are some circumstances. So how about people who don't have cancer? 
<laughs> well, this is someone who doesn't have cancer. They've got, you know, I'm seeing them for platelets, and okay, they've got cirrhosis. Somebody who doesn't have liver disease. Are. Somebody who doesn't have liver disease. Would you? I think the in moderation. I think the the concern with alcohol, with the exception of breast cancer, is with the amount that you drink in a day. Right. Um, so, not and that's, so not a bottle. A bottle of what? Gin? <laughs> no. That's what I was told and then, to me. And then I always ask what size bottle, because I had patients come in and they say, oh, I have three bottles of beer. And I go, three bottles of beer? They go, no, three bottles of beer. <laughs> how about so, marijuana? A lot of people call me, say, I need medical marijuana because I have nausea through chemotherapy. Uh, for nausea, <laughs> yes. Okay. For uh, appetite stimulation, uh, anorexia, when people are, they, they have no appetite whatsoever, their taste buds are gone, they're not feeling well, they're losing weight, you know, precipitously, uh, then yes, you, you know, you need to talk to them about um, things to stimulate their appetite and marijuana uh, is in that list of drugs. Also, I think that it's, uh, there's some data that it helps with neuropathic pain um, and just augments pain medication. It's not, it's not something I would give just for pain. I would give it for nausea primarily and for anorexia, but it, it, it may have those effects as well. What I have a problem with is when people say, oh, marijuana cures cancer. And there's a lot of... No. Uh, ah. Not that I'm aware, and um, so or you know decreases your risk, and that's where I have a problem with it. Unfortunately, we can't really write for it either. It's under federal law. We can under state law, but under federal law, you can't really write for it. So we have the oral uh, equivalents. At the matter now. Right. Uh, another question, Dr. Lin, you might might be the best person to answer this. People call. There, there have a lot of these low T centers now, you know, the testosterone centers where they say, oh, your testosterone is low, you get an injection. What impact does it ha have on the hormonal milieu and what impact does it have on cancers? Do we know enough about it? Um, I, I can speak for female. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, there are a randomized trial looking at increased libido uh, postmenopausal women with, with uh, testosterone. So uh, a lot of postmenopausal women really other than hot flush, and it really just say, Doc, you know, sex life is not the same anymore. Um, and, and I will put them on, and there is data to back that up. Uh, these are low dose. These are not high dose at all. Um, and in terms of for male, I know there's a lot of push now for, for testosterone replacement for men, and, but I'm not familiar with the, the data on the man. Susie, so. do we know what it does to prostate cancer or...? Uh... You know, it's, it's sort of... Uh, paradoxical. On the one hand, we know that in prostate cancer, as I was saying before, you, you're sort of going backwards. In, in prostate cancer, we block hormones and, you know, uh, prolong, um, it, well, inhibit the cancers. Um, I had to just recently look into this because a patient asked me about it. Uh, and so my, um, my gut feeling it was that it, was, it would probably increase the risk. But the data is sort of conflicting. It initially increases PSA, but not necessarily. And there's some data coming out where actually patients who have... Uh, so, okay, so there were these studies with men that had low levels or had erectile dysfunction, and they looked at their rate of prostate cancer, and they actually found that those patients had higher um, risk of uh, prostate cancer. So it, it was felt that testo low testosterone um, increased the risk mm -hmm. of uh, prostate cancer. And so there are some uh, researchers that are actually treating prostate cancer that have been on hormone blockage um, for a long time with testosterone and maybe a brief um, reprise or, or, or from uh, 
a couple months from, um, we don't really understand why it would. It doesn't make sense. It's counterintuitive for us. You want to say something? Well, Chomping I do, at the bit. Because I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little concerned that there we go. That prostate cancer is going to go the way of breast cancer. It took us a long time and a lot of patience to figure out that oh. hormone replacement for women was probably bad. I, I think that the data for prostate cancer is immature, and I don't think we know the answer there. I know personally I have taken care of some prostate cancer patients that we've cycled their hormones back and forth and been able to keep them off of chemo chemo, who are stage four, for a very long time. But I don't know what that means. I, I don't, and other people are doing this as well. I, I simply don't know, and I think that it's immature data, and I'm, I would be very cautious as a man in knowing that there could potentially be, conf there's conflicting information right now. We really don't know. And if we learned anything from breast cancer, it's that sometimes it takes a lot of people to figure it out. So I don't really know the right answer yet. I, I think if anybody's, I think uh, most urologists, if they're going to be putting someone on uh, testosterone uh, supplementation, uh, do biopsy to make sure that there isn't something there, you know, to begin with. Um, and I think that most are not putting patients on testosterone yeah. without advising them that there might be a risk. So I think what I see is a lot of this mushrooming of low T centers. I feel it's going the same way like we have tanning boots. Uh, you know, we know tanning boots have had uh, a label of being a carcinogen for a long time and that the risk of developing cutaneous malignancies, skin cancers is very high, but we have not been able to regulate it. What, what do you recommend your patients regarding tanning boots? Oh, I tell them not to do it, but I've done it myself in the past, <laughs> I know, but no more because the data is so strong. I mean, it really does increase skin malignancies. I don't even know how many fold. It's ridiculous how bad it is. And I mean, I think that, you know, as, as we all age, women that have, or, you know, most of us women, not just women, but men too, who've used tanning, I think we're going to see an escalation of skin malignancies uh, because it doesn't happen at the time you're doing it. It happens later, you know. So skin cancer is the fastest growing. Melanoma is one of the fastest growing cancers in this country, uh, second only to lung and um, and bronchus cancers in females, because I think females took up smoking a little later. It has not fallen off. That peak is still going up, but skin cancers are the most, the most common cancer in this country are skin cancers. We just don't count them. We don't count the squamous cell cancers or the basal cell cancers. We just pretty much count melanoma in the big skin uh, cancer group. We come to a completely different question. I had a patient who went to Mexico about a month back, and they told him that we're going to alkalinize your blood and um, it will going to cure your cancer. Any comments? Was he cured? Well, I don't know yet. So that actually comes from a, a study that was a, attempted in Japan, and I don't remember what year. It was many years ago. And the study was never able to be published, but where they looked at actually people taking alkalinized water as a way of um, suppressing cancer development. Um, but when you think about it, just scientifically, of course, they were not able to publish this study. It never was able to grab any traction. But it's kind of ridiculous when you think about it. The human body is so elegant, it maintains its pH where it wants to be. If you alkalinize yourself, and we do, we alkalinize people short term when they have leukemia and things like that. I don't even know if it's the right thing anymore, but sometimes we do. Um, and, you know, really, your body's going to work really hard to bring your pH to where it's supposed to be. And not only that, when you are exposing tumor cells to an alkaline pH, let's just say that you are, well, you're exposing all of your cells to that as well. And your enzymes don't work well at certain pHs. Everything is very, very, very closely synchronized. So it's kind of ridiculous, and it's not going to work. So I am very adamant, and I do not want my patients spending their money on it because it doesn't do anything. And it probably could be harmful, I think, if you took it to an extreme. I completely agree. <laughs> I think it's like the sugar issue, but even it, it, a little bit 
dangerous, I guess, because um, it, I think that these supplements or whatever don't actually change your, your serum pH. And if they did in one way or the other, usually your body, you know, if you give it too much acid, it's going to go to base. If you give it base, it's going to go to acid. So it's very nicely balanced um, because it needs to be. And um, if, it, if it can't, if it doesn't have enough of molecules of you know, oxygen or whatever to do it, then your lungs and your kidneys are going to work to bring you back to baseline because it's very dangerous if your acid level drops or you, know, you become very alkaline. So it's very um, well balanced. And these supplements don't really, I don't think, change the serum levels. Um, so one last question, and then we can wrap up. I go through airports, and they put me through these scanners, which has radiation. Mm -hmm. Will I get cancer? <laughs> Only you fly a lot. <laughs> How much do I have to fly to get cancer? <laughs> I don't actually know the, the doctor answer. in me says no. The person in me with two metal hips that rings and has to have s super security all the time says yes. Um, but I think the answer is probably no, but we don't know. I think we need to, to, to study this a little bit more. So there, there is, from what I've heard, there's very little radiation in... Uh, the, the scanning that they do. And if I fly from here to New York, the amount of radiation I would get just by being at a higher altitude is a significant amount of radiation. One chest X-ray radiation is equivalent to multiple numbers of these scans. So from the data that we look at, but it's the same question, a lot of what the government tells us, like the they're hiding a lot of different things. <laughs> it's like the tanning booth. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. We, I think we need... We need you know, they've just started doing this, and uh, I'm, I'm suspicious. I've heard the same thing that Vijay has, though, the same thing about it being really a very, very, very minute amount of radiation. I've heard the exact same thing, that you actually get more radiation when you're up at altitude than you got with all of your scans. So I, I think it's probably not an issue. Why, why people and even medical professionals are fearful is because one of the causes of sarcomas, which is a very, very devastating tumor of connective tissue can happen in a radiated field. There's a higher risk of it happening, but that is very high dose radiation for either breast or cervical cancer, which has been the most common. It's really been a pleasure to have you. I am sorry we have run out of time, and I wanted to thank uh, our audience here and also the viewers online for staying with us uh, for the whole hour. Thank you very much, and this debate will be continued. We will stay here to answer some of the questions here. Thank you.